Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and this is our fourth presentation. Um, so again, my name is Tram Nguyen and I'm the University of Washington's 2001-2022 Fulbright Canada um, Chair in Arctic Studies. And this presentation is sponsored by the Canadian Studies Center in the Henry Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington with the general support, generous support of the Global Innovations Grant from the UW Office of Global Affairs. So as Marion mentioned, this talk will be taped and become part of the Canadian Center's Arctic and International Relations series and posted on our website. So it's my pleasure um, to introduce our fourth speaker, um, Olivia Duncan, and her title, her, the title of her presentation is called Inuit Living and Thriving in Two Worlds. And Olivia is an Inuit advocate, artist, um, and spoken word performer from the community of Nunavik in Northern Quebec. Um, her work centers around education, housing, mental health, and the rights of Inuit youth. Olivia is passionate about her culture and breaking stereotypes so the world will be a better place for her children and for future generations of Inuit around the world. So without further ado, I want you to introduce everyone to Olivia. All right. Hi, guys. Olivia Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice. Thank you for all coming to listen to me speak. <laughs> um, my name is Olivia Aiki Duncan. I am a mixed Inuk um, from Northern Quebec, Kujuak specifically. I'm a mother, an artist, an advocate, um, an aspiring writer, um, soon to be college student, um, Inuk that grew up in the North. Um, and I know all of you were expecting a stereotypical Inuk person, but it's 2022 and this is what we look like now. Um, I have ancestry from the French. I have ancestry from Hudson's Bay Company men who left their children behind. Um, so I don't know where my white ancestry comes from. I grew up as thinking I was 100% Inuk um, without the color, without, but I speak the language and I've grown up there. So, um, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to share with you the realities of Inuit um, in both worlds, the traditional and modern world, and how we're thriving and, and trying to build a better place for not only indigenous people, but for the planet as a whole, because we can see the destruction that is happening, uh, the inequality that is happening, especially for Indigenous people, First Nations, Inuit and Métis. Um, so I'm here to speak about my realities and the realities of my people and what we are doing to better our basic rights, our li living conditions, our, our way of living. So thank you very much, all of you, for being here and for being interested. And thank you very much for helping Inuit in the way that you can. Um, I always say Inuit are amazing, capable people. Um, and we have the stereotype, this shame, this history that is keeping us stuck in a place. Um, and it's, it's time to wake up and we're waking up. The indigenous people are waking up and we're speaking our truths and we're so grateful to the people, the non-Indigenous that are there to help us, that are there to be our allies and to help us fight for basic human rights. So that's about it. My introduction of who I am and why I do what I do. Um, like I said, I am born and raised in Gujarat. Um, I am an Inuk woman. Um, and I fought a lot with myself as a non-Inuk also. Um, 
living in different worlds, living in the modern South, we call it the Southern society because it's South of us. Um, and this Western society and the Western systems that were placed upon our people. Um, and I'm very fortunate, but also very cursed that um, this is privilege for me. Blonde hair, white skin, green eyes is a privilege for me um, to get access to services, basic services, to create relationships with people that are non-Indigenous, to, to really bring them in first. So I, it's kind of a mask that I use to be more comforting to the Western gaze, to the Western eye. And then I drag them in and I'm like, I'm Inuk, <laughs> I'm super res and I, I, I'm real. And this is the reality of my people. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you kind of a thing but also this my white skin is also a curse because for a long time i had identity crisis growing up in the north i was the white person i was called the alu the little white girl um and the only reason why i have such a big connection is because i got to keep my language that was my key into my people um, back home, I fit in so well. I travel all, all across the region and a lot of people know me because of the work that I do for my people. So I am recognized as an Inuk person. But if some, some Inuk doesn't know me and I look at them, they see a white person. They don't see me as an Inuk person. And that really hurts me as an Inuk person. And living in, in Montreal now um, with my two children, I'm, I'm constantly going in between worlds and going in between languages. And I speak three languages. Inuktitut is my first, English is my second, and French is my third. I have a seven-year-old and a year and a half that I'm trying to, to bring into the world, but also be proud of their Inukness and, and trying to help them find a place within the world as an Inuk a Halunak and a Wigi, so an Inuk, a non, a white person and a French person, because we're in Quebec here. Um, it's its own other dynamic living in Quebec. Um, so we're not just living in two worlds. I should have actually titled it three worlds because <laughs> Inuit are living in three worlds. We live in the French Quebec world. We live in the federal and the pr provincial English world and then we also have our world and our beliefs and our languages so fitting into these worlds and surviving and thriving and I'm talking about surviving because these systems and these programs are sometimes actually very dangerous for my people um, and I go into hospitals and nursing centers and because inside I am Inuk, I am still very fearful of how I will be treated by social workers, of how I will be treated by people in the justice system, in the education system. But I know this gives me a way in more than it does my cousins. My cousins are pure Inuit, they are brown and black hair, real Inuit. Um, and I, I don't know the fear that they feel. If I feel scared looking like this, then they must be terrified to go ask for those services from healthcare, from police, from justice, um, because there are um, stigmas and, and stereotypes towards my people. Um, if you're at the hospital all the time for a stomach problem, you're an alcoholic you're automatically assume that you are a drunk native person and i have experienced that um i ended up getting backed after three days of being shot up with morphine and driving home they let us drive home because everything's like five minutes away <laughs> so they shoot you up and they're like you can go home and take a rest and you know and i came back in the evening when the doctor was off and 
Upon my arrival, the doctor was very annoyed that he had to leave supper to come and take care of this drunk native person. And he, he asked me if I had drank anything. And I was like, no, I didn't drink anything. I have a stomach pain and they I've been coming here for three days. I need help. In the end, I ended up getting medevac I spent four days in Montreal hospital and I had a real stomach problem. I had, I forget what I had, but, and I was told that I should not answer this doctor. I should not disagree with anything he says because he is the doctor. He knows best. I wanted to start yelling at the doctor, you're racist, you, you're stereotyping me, this is outrageous. But I was told that you cannot do that. You will not get the services. And we have to shut up. We have to have no dignity. We have to be under and just take the orders that we are given. And it's killing people. We have seen it here in Quebec. Um, we have seen videos of a woman dying in a hospital in Juliet. Um, a First Nations woman died here and she recorded the nurses talking about her in very racist forms. Um, and these are realities for my people. And like I said, I'm a privileged person of white color, of pure white privilege. And I use that and, and I'm not going to shut up because I'm safe because of my skin color. I have to fight for my cousins, for my family that have survived generations of trying to genocide us, trying to make us disappear. Um, Canadian genocide is still happening. Government policies and programs are still killing people. They are hurting communities. They are diminishing our knowledge, they are attacking our beliefs um, and the way we work. And we are being treated as if we do not know what's best for us and our health care. And me, I come in and I say, we know what's best. And you guys, you amazing students and professionals, you know what's best too. Why can't we work together? We cannot diminish anybody's knowledge and everything. So like I said, me, I'm a dropout. I'm a high school dropout. Um, I was just an angry youth off the street yelling at politicians. And this is how I ended up doing this work. This is how I'm speaking to university students in Washington. Like I'm mind blown. I'm supposed to be dead. I am not supposed to be here. I wrote my first suicide letter when I was 12 years old. And every day I'm grateful that I understood my history in order to beat those stereotypes, in order to do better than that. And I still struggle. My family struggles today. My mother is, is a residential school, is a, a, a daughter of residential school survivors. My grandparents were residential school survivors. They later ended their lives when I was a teenager and a child. So all of these policies that government had created, and at the time it was for the better for us, to, to better our lives, but without understanding that really in the end, it didn't better our lives. It actually made it worse. And we today are dealing with those repercussions, those everything that had happened in the past is here now. And I didn't think me today as a 30 year old Inuk woman had any connection to residential schools, like has nothing to do with my life. My, my grandparents went through that. It, but when I understood everything, I could put the dots together and really understand the pain, the trauma, the social injustice in my communities, the lack of housing, the, I can understand where it comes from now. So I use my realities to educate the professionals in the Western world, the university students, the politicians, the, the policy makers. I try to educate them with my reality 
I don't have any fancy diplomas or certificates or anything like that. Um, my work is really real. Um, I, I fought to stay alive. And I want to make sure that those who are trying to help us with our housing crisis, with our health care, with our, I want you guys to know the reality um, and not just through these conferences and these classrooms, but get to know a real Inuk person, get to know an Inuk that, that lives these things that you guys are studying. People are really dying as we are writing these papers, as we are giving these presentations, my people are dying. Um, I don't have enough fingers or toes to count how many people I've lost to suicide, how many people I've lost to drinking and driving, how many people I've lost to sicknesses that were delayed diagnosis that could have been prevented, but we're in the North, we're isolated, so we don't have access to these. So I just want to help make people aware that this is the reality of our people. And while you guys are studying, while you guys are coming up with all these Western recommendations, that you have to be realistic and meet an Inuk person and get to know their reality. And this is one thing that's so simple that's always misunderstood. It's so simple. Inuit is plural. It is already plural. You cannot say Inuits. You cannot say Inuit people because you're saying people, people. So simple form, one Inuk. I am an Inuk person. If there are two Inuit, two Inuk, Inuk, Maku, and then Inuit is three or more. In our language, it always works like this. One, a pair, three or more. So kamik is a pair of kamiks, two boots. Haklik, it always extends that. Li, kamik, and that. So when people say like, you're Inuit, I'm like, no, I'm Inuk. I am one Inuk. My people are Inuit. And just the simplest form of knowing that, because stereotypically, historically, we are known as Eskimo. Um, and this was not a word that we gave ourselves. This was a colonizer word to describe us. And we don't use that. We are Inuit. I am an Inuk. And having that basic base knowledge of our people is, is a respectable way to to know about that and to have respect for us and what we want to call ourselves and what we identify ourselves as. So I actually ran away from home <laughs> a few years ago. I left home in October of 2019 after 30 years of surviving, of literal survival in my community. Um, and I had a daughter and I couldn't allow her to live in that reality. I had to leave before my daughter started school. So we left when my daughter was four years old. And for reasons of better health care, for reasons of having a better education, of having access to opportunities and access to to a different world and a quality of life that doesn't exist up north because of outrageous prices, because infrastructure doesn't exist, because cultural understanding is missing. I had to leave that space and I left my family behind and it was extremely hard and it is extremely hard for my daughter. Um, she lived her first four years, she remembers home. I actually just got back on Monday from home. We went home for Easter weekend. Um, we had our annual skidoo race, our annual Easter egg hunt. Um, I spent three days out on the land. We slept in a cabin with like a honey bucket for a toilet and <laughs> like the real land. And my daughter was so heartbroken when we had to leave. 
and she started speaking Inuktitut more. She started wanting to be on the land, but I had to take her out and I had to explain to my seven year old why we left, why there are disadvantages for my people, why my people are in pain and why they are walking around damaged. Why are people drunk? Why are kids in youth protection? Why? It's because of the historical trauma and my people are still in pain and they don't understand where it comes from and they believe that it is their fault and we live in shame. And we ha when we have institutions and universities and people that believe that we are uneducated and that we are less than, they kill my people. Um, and I had to take my daughter out of there. And, and I had a son while I was here. <laughs> I have two babies now. Um, we're gonna get educated, all of us together. I just got accepted to go back to school. I'm going to college. Um, I was a high school dropout and I'm 30 and now I'm like, whoa, whoa. I need to grab onto these opportunities. I need to take what my people were not given and I need to fight for their voice, for the voice of my grandparents and and get through to university students and to policymakers and to government officials to help them understand the realities and our truth and to help my people's knowledge fit into the western world because inuit i think i think i'm biased but i'm gonna say inuit are the most brilliant people on planet earth okay nobody can survive in the frozen arctic no like i'm telling you and for so many years i was so ashamed to be an inuk person i would say i was a white person i didn't want to explain to people my identity i did not want to try to break down stereotypes so for a long time i would say i was a white person until i learned the reality until i really understood their knowledge their adaptability their resilience and i woke up as an Inuk person for real. And I said, I am Inuk, I am brave, I am strong, I am resilient, I am adaptable. My people invented the sunglasses. <laughs> My daughter almost got snow blind. While we were out on the land for two days, she refused to put sunglasses. And I was telling her, Inuit knew best. We created sunglasses because snow blindness is very, it, it happens here. And then I helped build a kayak, which everybody calls a kayak. That is an Inuit invention. The kayak, it's called a kayak, is an Inuk invention that the Western system took and they, they're making money out of it. And nobody knows that the people who invented that boat are the survivors, the strongest people of the Arctic, my people, which everybody views as drunk native idiots and we're trying to wake the world up that our knowledge that you that the western system degraded is real and it's 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 transferable into the western world and it will actually make the western world a much much better place and we could all thrive in all worlds hey there's a war going on there's people dying all across the world there's racism what are we doing as indigenous people we need we understand that the world the mother earth is the only thing that can sustain us and we as people of the planet we need to wake up and work together or there's no point in doing anything and and i get really hopeless sometimes I get, I have a really hard time um, because of the systems that I have to face, because of the judgment that my people have, because of the behavior that my people have. I get mad at my own people for, for behaving the way that they do, but I understand them also. Why are they drunk? Why? Because there's in so much pain and you, we cannot tell them to get over it if they have never even spoke a single word about it their hurt has been kept inside of them 
we've all heard of the residential schools we've all heard of the dog slaughters we've heard of of relocations of inuit we've heard of the eskimo identification tags but have you felt the dog slaughter have you felt the eskimo identification tag that's why i'm here to help you feel it and not just read about it uh, i have a tattoo of an eskimo identification tag my father had an eskimo identification tag the last tag was printed in 1985 the canadian government refused to learn our names because it was too hard to say uhuta so they tagged us with numbers and we called these e tags or dog tags and every inuk had to wear that as a necklace or that was their identification and the government said this was to to help us to monitor us and to make sure that we're doing well so they can have it in the records but when people were sent away for tuberculosis treatment they were lost there are graves all across canada of inuit who were buried and their family didn't know inuit are still searching for their family across canada and they said these tags were to help keep us tracked. Where is her grandmother? Where is her aunt? If you tracked us, if this was to help us, give us our truth, where are our bodies? And you know, it's the reality. People don't like to use the word genocide, people. I'm here to tell the truth, guys. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be dead. My people are supposed to be disappeared. And I'm here and I'm going to work with, with you guys. I'm going to work with what I have. And we're going to start listening to indigenous people or we're going to all die. I'm sorry, but it's the reality. We need to wake up. It is what it is. And, and I'm waking up, I'm waking up to the reality and I'm helping people understand the reality and I'm helping them find new ways to, to build new policy, new procedure, new systems. Um, I work right now with the Makivik Corporation, which is the mother organization of the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement. Um, this JBNQA agreement, um, was between Hydro-Quebec, the provincial government, and the Inuit. They were coming into our land and demolishing everything to make a hydroelectric dam um, without the consent of our people. And in 1970s, my people woke up and they took this corporation and this government to court. Um, we had to give up our land. We had to cease and surrender our rights to our land in order to get a hospital, in order to get a school, in order to get a police system, an education system, we gave up our rights to our land and they gave us money. And this money has built uh, the school board, which is Katavik Ilisak Nilirinik. They have built Makivik Corporation, which is our advocacy throughout the world. Uh, we have the Nunavik Police Force, which is supposed to be uh, an Inuk police force, but unfortunately, it's extremely hard to have Inuit police officers. Um, all of these things were created with this money that we sold our land off. And when people say they have free education and they have free health care and they're lazy and they're all on welfare, it's at the cost of my mother drinking. It's at the cost of my people dying. It's at the cost of being unable to eat country food, caribou, beluga, fish. Um, we, we are receiving more and more quotas, hunting quotas every year because more and more ships are passing through the, the Northwest Passage. More mining is coming in. So us, we're being penalized. But if Inuit can work with these organizations to bring traditional and modern mining i don't know i don't even know if that's possible but we we have to try we have no choice to try 
and I'm like I said, I'm not a professional, but I'm going to try whatever I can. I just keep screaming at the top of my lungs, educating people. That's all I'm doing is talking and talking and talking. And I always say Tupac. <laughs> I always quote Tupac. I quote this at the last talk too. Tupac once said, I'm, I'm not, I may not be the one to change the world but I will be the one to spark somebody's mind that will change the world. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just talking and then some professional like you students or some politician will go, hey, I can help her. I have the professional training and skills and attitudes for this. I can help her do that. So that's what my purpose is. And what I try to do is bring those both worlds, the Western world, the French world together to create a quality of life for my people because I'm sick of surviving. I left home, but I, I always have guilt. Um, while my people are dying, dying, I'm living in a fake suburbia. I have a tennis court right outside my window. And it's, I'm just completely emerged into two worlds, into two realities, into a completely different way of living and trying to navigate that and to help people help me navigate that and work as a team and as Inuit, as modern warrior where it's 2022 inuit are amazing from my time and millennia so let's join forces and let's do it together is my time already up no you still have about um 20 more minutes olivia so i've i just came with a very general presentation to help you guys kind of understand why i'm sitting in front of you why a high school dropout in a kid is giving presentations to university students. Um, I'm always extremely nervous and I feel I always have imposter syndrome that I shouldn't be doing this work that I am not valid. But every time I do speak, somebody somewhere helps one of my people and it keeps one of my family members alive for at least an extra day um, keeping my people alive and keeping them okay is my number one priority and being honest and extremely real and extremely blunt is the way i do it but i'm always being told that i should be careful what i say i should be careful how i say it because it's it's not proper and there was no powerpoint and i didn't have statistics and i kind of poked people's bubbles but i feel like people will not make change unless they are uncomfortable if they continue to be comfortable in in their surroundings in their realities and nobody ever pokes their bubble then i don't think anything will change so me i call myself a shit disturber i'm a i'm an activist i'm a i'm a i'm just a speaker and i'm just trying to stay alive myself. Um, I'm just trying to stay alive myself. And I'm trying to navigate the systems and to, to be alive. And so I went home last weekend um, for Easter weekend, like I was saying, and I was part of a filming with uh, CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Um, they were doing a documentary series about indigenous people and their culture and bringing identity back. And I got a traditional hand poke tattoo, which took four hours to get poked in the throat a thousand times. Um, and I did that with an Inuk youth. Um, who's learned how to traditional hand poke tattoo and my tattoo represents I come from Kutra, which is where the tree line ends in in Quebec um, past my hometown there are no more trees it's barren rock land and Inuit survived it um, in amazing fashion 
so this line represents the tree line it represents my home but then you can also see dots on each side which represent me being able to walk in both worlds in both sides of the tree line in both ways in all forms and languages so that was the tattoo that i got this weekend that solidified me i believe as an inuk woman um, traditionally tattoos were banned and we were shamed for tattoos um, christianity religion wiped almost wiped it out we're very fortunate that we're bringing it back um, traditionally inuit women would get their first chin tattoo on your first period so as young as sometimes nine ten years old you could get your first tattoo and that represented womanhood you have become a woman my grandmother didn't have these my great grandmother didn't have these because they were the colonized they were the ones that were living beside hudson's bay company posts um, and i i learned about it and the significance it meant um, not just culturally but spiritually um, this was a spiritual practice. These tattoos helped you cross into the other side. Um, when you would cross, you would meet your family and they would recognize you by your tattoos. So when I, when I learned about this, I couldn't help but cry because my grandmother went to the other side without her tattoos. Um, and her great grandparents and her grandparents couldn't find her. But I'm hoping maybe there is a heaven. <laughs> maybe she's up there in heaven. She talked about heaven a lot and this glorious place in the clouds. So maybe she's there. And because Inuit believes that if you didn't have your tattoos, you would be stuck in limbo, unable to pass. Your family was unable to get you to bring you to the other side. So I have to believe that she's in a giant castle chilling with Jesus, I guess. Or I have to believe that I got my tattoos for my grandparents in order for them to, to pass on and to bring back that tradition. And to my daughter was amazed. She can't wait to get tattoos. She's seven years old. Like it's, it's coming back. We're waking up a whole new generation and we're not ashamed anymore. We don't. We really don't care at the end of the day if you don't like our traditions, our food, our whatever, you know, it's, it's, we're trying to live in a world and we're trying to balance that and we're going to work with what we have and Inuit are an adaptable people. They are so adaptable. Inuit who lived where there was no trees would would get driftwood to build tools to you know they they built hayaks i built a piece of a hayak which is this part my tattoo here it's just the one part of a hayak the kayak that inuit built and these people built this without a manual without a single power tool with with just knowledge passed down through history and history with animal products, animal bones, driftwood. They did this and they created the best boat in the world. Hello, why are we treated as if we are nothing? And I feel like we're coming back. Uh, educated is native is a dangerous native person, I always say. <laughs> And I'm going back to get educated. I'm going to college. My child is in school. She's learning French. My son is in daycare. And we're the next generation of Inuit to, to thrive in the new world. And it's a new world for all of us, not just for indigenous people. COVID has changed everything. Um, everything has changed. So let's work together. Let's, let's save all of us. <laughs> together so i think that's about it i want to say thank you so much for listening um, and for for wanting to learn about inuit and for wanting to help us um 
because we have a lot of non-Inuit that come to my community, to my region, to come for an adventure. They want to see the northern lights and they think it's so beautiful, but there is trauma and there is healing that needs to happen and they need to be aware that this is not just a job you're coming to. This is not an adventure, a ski time. This is my daughter's life. Um, this is my grandmother's land. And I just want to say me for, for helping us, for truly wanting better for everybody. Thank you so much, Olivia, for, for that talk. Um, you know, I, I might have a bias, but I, I really like your style. Um, it's, I think part of why it's so powerful for me the first time I heard you talk was, was your candidness. Um, it, it's like you said, it's not just about reading about it, hearing about it, studying about it, it's, it's real. Um, and that's what I wanted the students and also the public to have an opportunity to, um, to be inspired the way that I was <laughs> when, when I first heard, heard, heard you talk. Um, so I wouldn't change a thing <laughs> in terms of how you present. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your personal experiences. Um, one, one of the questions that I have, and I'll open it up to, um, to the group, especially those that, that are joining outside the class. Um, but I wonder from your, from your first talk um, that I had the privilege of listening to, as well as this one, what was your turning point? Because as, as you mentioned, you were an angry teen. Um, what was that moment? What, what was that point that made you have that mind shift that, you know, now I'm, I'm going to do something about this or I'm going to turn my life around or, or, or that move away from your family, which I can't imagine how, how hard that, that must have been. Um, so I wonder if you can speak um, a little bit about that. To me, my first shift ever from an angry teenager to an activist mm -hmm. Um, I was unable to get housing <laughs> because I didn't have any children. Um, back home, our housing system is very, it's not the greatest system. So I started writing letters to politicians and that's how my activism started. Mm -hmm. But what really changed me as an Inuk person and made me a proud Inuk person, I took this workshop, it's called the Blanket Exercise. It's by a program called the Kairos. Kairos blanket exercise. You guys can find it online. It's an experiential workshop where they take you through the history of Canada, literally, physically. Um, you're not sitting in a classroom listening to statistics. You are sitting on blankets that represent land and those blankets are being stolen from under your feet and you get to experience what had happened throughout Canadian colonial history. And that made me realize like, holy cow, we're the strongest. I am Inuk, I am Inuk. I will identify as an Inuk person and I will tell them what happened. So that was in 2012. That really completely changed my identity as an Inuk person, my pride and everything. And for many years, I struggled. I was on the youth committee. I was on the regional youth council. I worked in employment with youth. I spoke at high schools. I did a lot of work, but nothing had seemed to be changing. And back home, I find I'm too woke. My people are still in pain. They're still sleeping. So I was the negative one who, who realized everything that was wrong with my community. And people were like, You're, there's nothing you could do. I said, no, we have no choice. This is not normal. We have to vocalize this to realize it's not normal and then figure out how to change. But I was constantly being told I was a negative person. I only saw the negative. And like I said, I was too woke. I had to leave because I was becoming angry. I was becoming bitter towards people who were telling me to be quiet, to shut up about the struggles to not say it bluntly to say it nicer just to, to say that my friend killed herself in a nicer way so i don't shock the people but my people are dying so i had to leave and i left i left my jobs i 
I just left and I saved myself. I found, I'm, I'm seeing a therapist since the last time I found a therapist, an indigenous therapist. Um, I've been trying to, to help myself before I can really help my people. So I've had many awakenings and I'm going to have many more awakenings and I'm going to do much better than I ever can, than I ever am doing now. And I want Inuit to believe that they can and they will do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. and, and the truth is hard to hear, but it needs to be heard um, to, to that point. So, I mean, I can listen to you for days and ask questions, but I'll open it up to, um, as I mentioned, especially students that are joining outside of the Arctic class, because um, students in the class will have another hour with you. Um, so I'll open it up to um, the audience. And if anyone has a question, feel free to raise your hand or say it um, or write it in the chat um, for Olivia. Sure, so we have a question that just came in from um, Gerard. It says, what are your thoughts um, on Nunavik? I know there is a severe shortage of housing in the capital, as well as an extremely high cost of food. But in general, are there advantages as an Inuit to live in an area administered solely by Inuit as opposed to Labrador or Quebec? And can you see the living standards improving in Nunavik? Thank you for your excellent heartfelt talk. Solely, I mean, administered solely by Inuit. This is false. Um, Inuit in Nunavik, we are in Quebec. We are from the 55th parallel and up. Um, Quebec believes that it owns the rights to our land. Um, if we're talking about Quebec's real land mass, we own, we live on most of it. We live on one third of Quebec's land mass. We hunt, we travel, we camp on this land mass but it belongs because we had sold it for education, for healthcare. It belongs to the federal and provincial governments. Um, and we always work in tri uh, tripartite agreements with two different governments. And then we have our local government, um, which has no legal powers, no legal authority. Um, so solely administered by Inuit is not a fact. Um, right now I work with Makivik with the Inuit Advisory Committee, which is a team of Inuit that are trying to build uh, self-determination. We had written a constitution, an Inuit constitution for our people. We are trying to create an Inuit government, but what is an Inuit government? What is Inuit self-determination in a system that we have to participate in Western governments. We cannot just walk off the planet and go back into igloos. So the reality of having our administration to ourselves is not a reality. Um, and it's very hard, like the healthcare system, the education system, the education system is not made for my people. We do not read from books. We learn from watching and seeing and doing. But in a Western society, the government will only agree if you pass tests, these certain tests. The government will only agree if you follow their way of learning. So when people say indigenous people are uneducated because they don't have diplomas from these Western systems, they're very wrong. We have knowledge in so many other ways. Like I said, if I dropped any one of you off in Cooj and left you out there, you, you wouldn't be able to survive. Um, those are knowledge, those are practical life surviving knowledge that only Inuit have. And we're so privileged. So bringing that into these systems and these ways of administering funding and these ways of doling out education needs to be looked at and that's what we're trying to do we've spent many years uh, talking to policymakers. we have a governor general now who is an inuk canadian from my community 
um, Governor General Mary Simon from Kuchuak. So we're getting out there. Can I see the living standards improving? I have to have hope. Like I have to, I, I can't see them happening anytime soon in, in the fashion and in the speed that I think it should be and we need it to be. But I have to have hope that my people will, will have a better standard of living. And that's why my children and I are going to get educated so I can one day go back home and bring up those standards of living and bring a healthy, positive way of living. So it's, it's a tricky question. We're inside so many systems and it's not as simple as having an Inuk government. What is an Inuk government? Do we have a house of commons? Is there a speaker? Traditionally, we would meet in a giant igloo and the whole community would make decisions together. It wasn't just elected people. So it's very different ways of making decisions for, for having a quality of life. So thank you for that question. And it's a big, vague answer, but it is what it is. And we're trying to work on our, on, on our future. So thank you, Jared, again, for, for your question. Um, Mohammed, did, did you want to read your question or did you want me to, to read it to Yeah, I can also speak, no problem. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the nice talk. So I was actually thinking that I, I, I don't, I know about Sami in Norway because I live in Norway. So do you have any plan for any, like any parliament from Inut, like Sami parliament in Norway or already you have, I don't know. And do you have any uh, university or higher education institute for Inuit? Because it is very important to preserve the language and culture uh, and to for capacity building in f for the future generation. So my question is that, do you have these two? Thank you. Cool, thank you for those questions. Um, so talking about self-determination and creating an indigenous Inuit government, um, we've looked at many different kinds. Um, We've looked at Greenland, we've looked at the Sami, we've looked at uh, Nunavut, which is in Canada, it's a territory. Um, and we looked at what types of government, do we have a parliament, do we have a house of commons, but that's a Western government, that's a Western system. Do we just slap on our language and say it's a it's an Inuk system? I don't believe we can just take a Western system, put our language on it, and it's going to work. Um, so that's a discussion we have a lot of the times. What is an Inuk government? What is governing the Inuit way? These House of Commons, these, these members of board, those are a different system. Like I said, Inuit really was consensus for the whole community and not elected officials making decisions. It was mostly the elderly and the young that were considered, which is not reality in Western systems. Um, so we have looked at different governments and there's a huge study, we're studying what is available and how can we make a hybrid version? Maybe it's a, it's a hybrid version, like I keep saying, we take some of the Western systems, but we also bring our systems back. So House of Commons is kind of just, it's a Western system that we don't want to just slap our language on. So that's a discussion we're always having. About having higher education or university for my people, um, it's, it's not a reality yet. Somebody, hi Tina, Tina Pisuktik Inuit Taparit Kanatami is in the process of consulting with urban Inuit, Inuit in the regions, about the creation of an Inuit university. It's in discussions right now, um, but like I said, there's systems and programs and policies that governments have made that we have to follow. So we're, we're in the process of creating curriculums. We're in the process of accrediting knowledge and it has to be approved by non-Indigenous people which is kind of ridiculous, but it's the system that we're in. So we're using systems 
that are not ours to make systems ours. It's, it's weird, it's hard, but it is the reality. Right now in our schools, the first few years are only in our language, in Inuktitut. Um, and then later on, you get to pick if you wanna go to French or English. And then there's a post-secondary program for Inuit from Nunavik and Nunavut. Our program is called Nunavik Sivunitsavut. This is a program that's in partnership with John Abbott College, which brings Inuit students to Montreal to learn ironically about our language, about our history, about the culture. We learn about tattoos. We learn about songs that were banned. We learn about drum dancing. We light our lamp, our traditional lamp. We write essays. I wrote my first essay all in syllabics in Inuktitut. I was 30 years old. This was like three years ago. So these things are coming and, and it's seriously waking my people up because like I said, education in a Western form and education in a traditional form is very different. We were learning how to sew and that was a part of arts class. But like I said, a, a non Inuk had to approve that it was a legitimate way of learning and they had to accredit sewing of gummies. And a white person had to say, yes, this is the correct. It's just mind blowing, but we are using the systems that are in place and it is the reality. So we're building on those things. We're, we're building on them. We will have an Inuk university one day. Yeah, I think it's it is very necessary, and I think you should be a little bit open to non-Inuit community as well. To uh, like, so the people who want to be empathetic and want to learn this language, you should allow them. And I think that would be better for more uh, capacity building in the community, and people will know more. So when people don't know about this, then the people will not be empathetic of the indigenous population. That is very important. And I think you can follow the um, Sami Applied University of Science in Norway. They have very good curriculum and uh, the system in, in all indigenous issues like the crafting, the um, hunting, everything is included in the curriculum. It's true that they need to uh, organize as per the government rules and regulation. That is somewhat... Uh, yeah <laughs> atypical but definitely as it but people can learn and they are in the the young generation and i think in every city they have some um, organization or there is some barnehage or um, kindergarten uh, it's preserved for the sami population so you can also try for that for the inuit people in all major cities in canada uh, the people who are from inuit they can uh, like admit their kids in those kindergarten. Thank mm. you. Yeah, we're open to that. We have non Inuit that are in our daycares learning Inuktitut. We have Inuit, non Inuit who are living in our communities and their kids are learning Inuktitut and they're learning in, in the high schools. But outside of our communities, those are not available. Those, um, and I keep, and we keep saying, um, bringing people together. But we need to also understand that my people have not been able to have these systems. So right now we're building them for us, for our people to get educated about our realities. And then we will open the space to non-Inuit. Once we have gotten our pride back, once we have gotten on our feet, then we will welcome everybody. And that is the next step. I keep saying so many relationships were broken in the past and we need to work with everybody today. But at the moment, I'm sorry to be like, it's just for us right now. People are wanting to get tattoos. People are, because it looks cool. People are wanting to learn the language because it sounds cool, but my people are losing the language and we do not have resources to keep that. So we're trying to build that for our people first and then we will open up. So Nakutmi, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Arbaz, I know you just typed the question, but I think um, we can save it for the class. Arbaz is one of the students in the class and we'll start with your question, Arbaz. Um, 
but it's right on the mark in terms of it's 3.30. So I'd like to thank Olivia again um, for your presentation and for sharing your experiences and insight um, with, with our audience today. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, and for those who are in the Arctic 401 class, um, we'll take five minutes um, before we log on to our second Zoom link for our Q&A with, with Olivia. Um, so Olivia, feel free to take five minutes as well before you join on to the second Zoom. Perfect. See everyone soon. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Bye. Bye.